Whenever I'm teaching a first semester calculus class, near the end we get around to doing some integration. And for the first day of integration, we often calculate a couple of integrals using the definition via a limit of Riemann sums. But those integrals are generally very, very simple low degree polynomial functions. Well, today I'd like to do an example where we calculate an antiderivative of cosine via this limit of Riemann sums. But in order to do this maybe seamlessly, we're going to use the following identity. So we have the sum as k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of cosine k theta is equal to half plus the sine of 2 n minus 1 over 2 theta over 2 times the sine of theta over 2. And here we're going to use the fact that the cosine of a is equal to the real part of e to the i a, where a is a real number. And that's because we've got this Euler expansion of the complex exponential, which says e to the i a is cosine a plus i sine a. Okay, so let's get to it. So like I said, we want to find the sum as k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of the cosine of k times theta. But that's going to be the real part of the sum as k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of e to the i theta. And I'm going to raise that to the k power. So that's the same thing. I just use exponent rules to bring that k outside. But I did that so that this looks like a geometric series, a finite geometric series, that is. Notice here my starting term is uh, 1, e to the 0, and my common ratio is e to the i theta. And so here I can use the standard formula for the sum of a finite geometric series. That'll leave us with e to the i n theta minus uh, 1 over e to the i theta theta minus 1. Okay, well now let's re-expand this in terms of sines and cosines and then put the real and imaginary parts together. So that'll leave us with, we have the real part of cosine of n theta minus 1 and then plus i times the sine of n theta. And then this is all over, it'll be the cosine of theta minus 1 plus i times the sine of theta. And I didn't close that off because what I want to do is extract the real part. And in order to do that, I need to multiply the denominator by its complex conjugate. That maybe makes it a little clearer how to extract the real part. Okay, so let's do that. So the complex conjugate of the denominator will be cosine of theta minus 1 minus i times sine of theta. So we need to multiply the numerator as well as the denominator by that. Okay, so there we have it. But now we can do this multiplication step and then extract the real part all at once. So observe that by a standard rule for multiplying complex conjugates, that's, that denominator will be the cosine of theta minus 1 squared plus the sine squared of theta. And now for the numerator, observe that we only achieve a real part by multiplying the real part of both terms. So that would be this cosine of theta minus 1 and this cosine of n theta minus 1, or the pure imaginary part of both terms. That'll be this i times the sine of theta, or this minus i times the sine of n theta. Okay, so let's do both of those products. So that'll leave us with cosine of n theta times cosine of theta minus cosine of n theta minus the cosine of theta, and then let's see, plus the sine of n theta times the sine of theta. There I multiplied all that stuff out. And then likewise, while we're at it, let's multiply out what we have in the denominator and observe that we get, let's see, it'll be cosine squared theta minus 2 cosine theta plus 1 plus sine squared theta. But that 
Cosine squared and the sine squared will add up to one, leaving us with two minus two cosine theta. Okay, so let's bring that up to the top and then we'll keep going. Okay, so here's where we landed so far. And now we're gonna use a sum and product identities to simplify this cosine of n theta times cosine of theta, as well as this sine of n theta times sine of theta. Okay, so now let's start with our product to sum identity for the cosine. So this will leave us with one half. We'll have the cosine of n minus one times theta plus the cosine of n plus one times theta. And then after that, we'll just bring down these next three terms. So that'll be cos n theta, a cos theta, and a plus one. And then for this sine term, we'll have a plus one half, and then we'll have a cosine of n minus one times theta minus cosine of n plus one times theta. And then we're gonna like simultaneously use a half angle identity to rewrite this denominator. And this denominator can be rewritten as four times the sine squared of theta over two. And you can see that by looking at the half angle formula for sine of theta over two, then you can square both sides and multiply by an extra two and you'll end up with something like this. So now let's observe that some stuff cancels. Observe that this cosine of n plus one times theta is attached to a half and the one over there is attached to a minus half. So there, we can get rid of those. And then the cosine of n minus one times theta, they're both attached to a half. So they'll just add up to a whole. So that'll leave us in the end with the cosine of n minus one times theta minus the cosine of n theta plus one minus the cosine of theta. And then this is all over our four sine squared of theta over two. Okay, so now we can use, well, the same sort of half angle formula for this term right here. We can rewrite that as two times the sine squared of theta over two, really just in parallel to what we saw before. In fact, for that portion, it would have been, you know, maybe advantageous not even to rewrite it. That being said, I think this works. And then we can use uh, maybe a relative of the product to sum identity to rewrite this. And this can be rewritten as two times the sine of two n minus one over two times theta times the sine of theta over two. But now observe that this portion of the numerator, this two sine squared portion, will almost completely cancel the denominator. It'll cancel it down to just leaving us with a one half. And then the next bit will leave us with a sine of two n minus one over two times theta. But we cancel the square down to just a first power and we still have a two in the denominator, finally leaving us with where we wanted to end up for our tool. Okay, so now let's use that to find an antiderivative of cosine using the definition. Okay, so now we're ready for the main event. Now that we've developed our tool, we can find an antiderivative for cosine. Notice I'm saying an antiderivative for cosine because antiderivatives are only unique up to a constant. When you write an antiderivative in this form, the constant is controlled by this lower bound of integration though. Okay. So this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of delta theta times the sum as k goes from uh, zero to n minus one of the cosine of theta sub k. Where of course what's going on here is we're taking the interval from zero to x and we're splitting it into n equal pieces. So zero is theta sub zero, x is theta sub n. And then of course, we've got theta sub one right after theta sub zero, theta sub two here, and then right before x, we've got theta sub n minus one. 
So since we're splitting that into n equal pieces, and I guess I should say each piece is delta theta units long, that's gonna make delta theta equal to x over n, and it'll make theta k equal to k times x over n. So that gives us a way to rewrite our limit of our Riemann sums in terms of things that are a little bit easier to work with. So now we'll have this limit as n approaches infinity. We have our x over n, our sum as k goes from zero to n minus one of the cosine of kx over n. The fact that we're taking the sum from zero to n minus one is because we're using left-hand endpoints for our rectangles, if you will. Of course, the continuity of our function means that we can take any point as a test point for the height of our rectangles. And the antiderivative is well-defined. Okay, great. Okay, so now let's dive into it. From here, we can use our identity to rewrite this sum. So we've got our limit as n approaches infinity, our x over n, and then we've got a half, and then plus, it'll be the sine of 2n minus 1 over 2n times x. Because observe that here, the role of theta is being played by x over n. And then in the denominator, we have 2 times the sine of x over 2 times n. Okay, nice. So now let's rewrite this in kind of a suggestive way. We've got this limit as n goes to infinity. We have x over two times n plus x over two times n over the sine of x over two times n, and then times the sine of two n minus one over two n times x. But now let's see what happens to each part of this limit. So this x over two times n will clearly go to zero because that denominator is growing without bound. This x over two times n over the sine of x over two times n will approach one. That's a well-known limit. And then this first portion of the argument of sine will also approach one because it's a rational function where the degree of the numerator is the same as the denominator and the two constants are the same. And well, that's gonna, in the end, leave us with zero plus one times the sine of x. In other words, we're gonna have the sine of x as expected. And that's a good place to stop.